Oh, hi. This is a brand new podcast. And in it, we're going to meet both the people behind the electronic music that we love, and we're going to meet the people who make the equipment that they use to make the electronic music we love. In all these things, there is an amazing human story to be told, and it asks that eternal question, why we bleep? Why? So this whole shenanigan has been brewing for some time. You know, I'm an electronic musician, although I slightly balk at using the term musician because I'm not classically trained. I have absolutely no idea how to play the piano as such. Um, but I make music. That's the beauty of electronic music. As Brian Eno says, you remove the issue of skill and you replace it with that of judgment. Anyone with a sufficiently developed sense of judgment can become an electronic musician. Physical dexterity is removed from the whole process. And it's something that can be done entirely solo. Just you in your room is all you need. And so it's such an accessible hobby. You just need ears and some kind of input method. And all of us have computers. Our computers are fantastically powerful. We can do anything with them. And of course, we're living in just this stupidly incredible golden age where Music technology equipment, synthesizers, modular synthesizers, Eurorack synthesizers have never been more available, easier to get hold of, or cheaper than they are now. It is stupendous. It just gets better and better. And my personal madness for the last few years has predominantly revolved around Eurorack synthesizers. But that isn't exclusively what I use. Hell no. For those who've been following my YouTube channel, you may not realize, but I am very much a proponent of computer-based music as well. I make music using Ableton Live almost every day. Although a lot less so recently due to having to maintain a YouTube channel. But that is where I'm the most productive, frankly, in terms of actually producing finished music. But the amazing thing about getting into Eurorack particularly is as soon as you do a bit of research, it leads you to maybe send a few emails, ask a company a question, you know, why is this doing this or what is that and, and what do I need to make this work? And when you send that email, you get a reply. And the amazing thing about Eurorack is that so often that reply comes from the actual person who designed the damn thing that you are asking about. If you email Dupfer about something, and I've done this, it's very likely you'll get a reply from Dieter Dupfer himself. And Dieter is the guy who co-pioneered the format of Eurorack. And I find that incredible, you know, the closeness that you have to the people of Eurorack creates and fosters this kind of community that's just, it's so small. If you go to a, any kind of modular meet, it's so likely you're going to have the manufacturers there. And I think there are precious few industries these days where it's so tight knit and close, where the free sharing of ideas with the people who are designing the equipment to the people who are using it, it's just so close and bonded. And I think that's definitely something to celebrate. And I'm sure it's a contributing factor to the success of the format. And over the years, I've met those people and heard their stories. And that's basically what's inspired this podcast, because there's just so many interesting people in this industry and in the electronic music industry in general. It's a human story like all stories are. And I just think there's a huge value in understanding more about the process and stories behind the music and the equipment. And it's kind of a twofold thing. You know, in meeting manufacturers, it helps us deepen our understanding of the thought processes that go into the equipment. And it might inspire new ways for us to use it. And in terms of the electronic musicians that we'll meet, I'm always fascinated to understand their process. How do they make their electronic music? What idiosyncrasies have they learned? What do they say they would do differently if they could do it all again? Because as electronic musicians, so many of us, really most of us, and I include myself very much in this, are self-taught. We're all just trying to scrabble and teach ourselves how to do this moment by moment. 
So it's hugely valuable to share in the experiences of other people, work out what do you do? Maybe I can learn from that process too. And so that is what we're going to try and do. And that leads us to this first guest, Tom Whitwell. So Tom is a man that I have had some contact with for many, many years because Tom used to run a blog called Music Thing. Those of you who've been around for a while will probably remember Music Thing. It was a brilliant, slightly irreverent, but uniquely curated blog at a time where we didn't really have a lot of very good electronic music technology blogs. And it shouldn't be very surprising that Tom was such an engaging person to read because he is a journalist. In fact, believe it or not, Tom was the former editor of Mixmag from 1999 to 2002. He was the deputy editor of Face magazine from 2002 to 2004, consulted on NME and Loaded, and was the head of digital at The Times from 2007 to 2012, and co-introduced the paywall at The Times, quite interestingly. So he's product development consultant now with a company called Flux. But... On the side, he has started a small, very small business called Music Thing, which is obviously the name of the blog, but Music Thing, most people now think of as a modular synth brand. So in later years, Tom had been tinkering with, with various projects, so making guitar pedals and, and self-teaching himself to do these things in his shed in the garden. And obviously Tom, like all people, slowly got led down the Eurorack garden path. And as we're going to talk about, it's led to some of the most popular DIY modules in the entire format. But I think the main thing isn't so much the story of, of how he did his whole thing, but it's just, just simply listening to Tom's interests. Tom's interest in this whole endeavour, and by that I mean electronic music, is vastly deep. He's fascinated with the composers and history, the human stories behind it. In fact, actually, I relatively recently released a video in which Tom gives a potted history of synthesizers, but he does so focusing on the technology that was inside the synthesizers at the time. And it's also a very human history. He's just a very, very interesting dude and has, has excellent taste in music, minimalism, tinkering, and it's just a, a very engaging dude to talk to. So I trust you'll be interested, as I was, to meet him too. And with that, let's do the podcast. thing about music thing is it's basically i was trying to work out what it is like yeah what, what is music thing because it's not a, it's a brand but you're not a manufacturer no but you are but you're not so well so it started out as a blog in of course in the uh, which i remember the noughties um and then i sort of gave that up because i didn't have time to carry on doing it i suppose the thing i did was just not taking it seriously <laughs> in terms of up to that stage, there was lots of people writing about here is music gear and it is important and it will make you make better music and it will have this amazing tone and all of this stuff. And I suppose I was just saying, this is stuff that we like and stuff that we're into and stuff that I find really exciting and stuff that has amazing stories because they're attached to famous people. So mm. Something that was used by Aphex Twin or Stevie Wonder or whoever it was, yeah, yeah. is yeah, just much, much more interesting that. than something that wasn't. Mm. And we could. Uh, it was also the time when software meant you could just do anything in software if you wanted to make music. And the 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 I got a friend who's a composer, and he a, a TV soundtrack, a film soundtrack composer, and he's like. I'm not going to have time to mess about with this stuff. If the producer rings up at 11 o'clock and wants an extra three minutes, I'm not going to start cracking open some enormous modular synth, but I will... So I'll be able to do an awful lot of it in software and I'll be able to sample things and do that. So that was becoming possible and that meant, I think, that the hardware suddenly had a very different kind of... just 
fetish interest mm. in it. So uh, it was the hardware was uh, able to be like a play thing and not yeah. like a work thing. Yeah, exactly. So, and I, yeah. I, and I think people were using the software and getting more and more interested in the hardware. So at that stage, manufacturing was a lot more complicated and difficult. It was at the time when it was just the beginning of that kind of maker movement, the yeah. beginning of DIY, the beginning of kind of Arduinos and things. And I remember I was I was writing for Make Magazine when it first started and just the beginnings of that being possible. And I remember, so I stopped doing music thing because my work job was, was too busy. Um, and then a few years later, the I just got more and more interested in that sort of electronics stuff. So it was started with um, started with doing uh, Arduino, st- then doing sort of um, guitar pedals and that sort of thing. And it was a time that you were starting to be able to get stuff made in China much more cheaply and easily. Mm. So you started to be able to say, okay, you can design this circuit board and you can send it to China and they will send you back 10 of them for 25 quid. In some ways, when when blogging started, it was like that for publishing. So if I had wanted to do music thing in 2005 before blogging existed, I would have had to go to Future Music and get them to invest half a million or a million pounds in there, get a team, get publishing, get advertising. You know, that was because my background before that was in magazines and it Mm. was a very difficult, elaborate, capital intensive business. When blogging came along, you could say, I want to do a blog about weird synthesizers. It would cost literally nothing to produce. It would produce negligible revenue, mm. <laughs> um, but it could reach, you know, tens of thousands of people. So what then happened sort of a few years later, sort of 2010, 2012, was I started to be able to see there'd be a way of doing that with hardware. So the original idea for the the... Turing machine, when I sort of designed this circuit, I thought I didn't want to do manufacturing. I didn't like the idea of trying to stuff boxes and, and make sell it, boxes to make it. Yourself. Yeah. Um, so I published it the way you'd publish a blog. I said, these are the kit of parts. So if you take this file and send it to China, they'll send you circuit boards. If you take this file and send it to Mouser in, in um, Texas, they will send you the components you need. If you take this file and send it to anyone with a laser cutter, they'll make you the front panel. Um, and this is a license that enables you to do that. Uh, and almost... You'd open sourced it. Hadn't yeah, you? so I, I... And that just came from looking at how people were doing things within that open hardware community. Why, you why were you not... Why was there no inclination to try and... I know you didn't want to make it, but... You were like actively not wanting to make any money on it. It wasn't not wanting to make any money on it. Obviously, there was an element of I couldn't see this being something that would make money. Um, but it was more than the experience of doing the blog was that you get something out, you get an audience for it, and then you figure out is there some way of making money from it later. Mm. And so the blog used to make a few thousand pounds a year from Google ads and that yeah. sort of thing. Um, so I published it and almost immediately um, uh, Steve, who now runs Thonk, said, tell you what, I'll make some kits of this. I'll do a group buy for this. Um, and I thought, well, that's great. That makes the whole thing much easier for yeah, people. For everyone, it, it can happen. Pile in. Um, and he started doing that. And over time, that evolved into, into Thonk. Um, so the Turing machine was literally the start of his business, effectively. The way I remember it was, you'll be able to check with him. He may have a very different memory, but that was, that was the way I remember it, was that, that he he just took that on and said, this is how we're going to do it. was obviously an agreement, this. and like, as you say, you know, he pays you a, a license. A royalty but that was, that was actually much later on. At the beginning, right. it was purely, I'm going to have a go at this, and I said, great. It was just like go and feeling that it didn't necessarily, it wasn't, you weren't going to sell that many, or yeah. it wasn't going to be that interesting to people. Um, and, and so that mm-hmm. then gradually, that has become a much more robust you know business relationship um yeah and so and that's been very good for me i mean very very lucky with that in that he has done a great job of that so he does really good customer service people like him it it works very well you still haven't Um, made like turing machines as a finished you know no we haven't amazing how prolific it is yeah and everyone's made their own yeah because i'm like i know i've made one but 
do most are most people bothered? But like, would they want to do that? I think, think they do. I mean, I think that's <laughs> part of it as well. In that people are much more attached to something they've made themselves. I think. Mm. I think if you if you buy something and you like it, that's fine. You can be ev- evangelical about it a certain amount, but if you've actually made it yourself and you're not a professional and it's something you started, with. I mean, the the one that, that to some extent I find more amazing is the microphony, the the little contact mic mm. module, because that was almost a kind of conceptual joke, really. <laughs> when I did it, I just thought, could you do this? Would it be interesting to mm. do? Um, didn't really think, couldn't really think what it would be useful for. I just thought it was an interesting idea. Um, and that then got picked up. It was very cheap, very easy to make. It was a really good kind of gateway thing. So people, I think, saw that and thought, oh, that's interesting. I'll have a go at that. Mm. You know, if it doesn't work, I've lost 30 quid or something. Yeah, like, who cares? Um, and then people started using it in interesting ways. So then um, the Mutable Instruments gang started using it with... Uh, I think with Elements originally and with some of the Clouds alternative mm. firmware. Then Olivier came to me and said, well, I want to do one of these as mutual instruments. I said, well, obviously you can. That's how it, how <laughs> it works. Because it's open source, just um, like your stuff, actually. And it's... also, and it, it worked perfectly because his stuff was, it was all on exactly the same license. Mm. Uh, and I was just enormously flattered to have him doing that because I written about him, you know, 10, 12 years ago, a music thing, when he was making software for... Bargy's Loops. Yeah. He made Bargy's Loops. And I, yeah. I think I actually probably discovered Bargy's Loops through music thing. Yeah. And I bought a Palm Pilot just to run Bargy's Exactly, Loops, and it was an amazing thing at the time. Not yeah. because of Bargy's Loops, but because of the shitness of Palm <laughs> yeah. Pilots like, at the time. So, so it was amazing for him to do that, and it was really interesting to see his process from one removed, because he got in touch and said, you know, I'm doing this thing... He added so much to the circuit. He made the circuit so much just technically better and robust. more robust. Yeah. And it was about a year, year and a half of prototypes for this really small, really simple just that model. tiny little thing. And I would get, he would send me the first prototype and then something would come out with tiny changes on it. And he'd be like, oh, do you think that's better? And I was like, it all sounds great. <laughs> um, and just seeing that level of kind of commitment and effort that he puts into that stuff. Yeah. Um, well, it's uh, such a simple, it really is a simple product. Yeah. I have no idea it would take that long to find. Yes, define. so it was, I mean, it wouldn't, for me, if I was yeah. doing it, I would say, does this work? How can I figure out the interface so it's useful, so it's interesting? How can I get it out quickly and easily? But yeah. he was optimizing, so optimizing. He spent a really long time on the, the front panel, the textures area with the kind of raised PCB on it. I just said, oh, a, a circle would be nice. Uh, and then and he spent a lot of time in it, and then I revised the panel, you know, doing more with it, really. Yeah. Um, so that was a really, and that just, you, you see those all over the place, and I think people are much more just committed to them because they built it, and they will then mm. spend a bit of time working out how to use it. They will say, I can't sell it because it's not really worth anything, but they then figure out interesting, clever things to do with it. I saw a, um, a product that made me think about that. So, um it was, it's called the A-Frame. I don't know if you've seen it. It's like, um, it's a guy who is, I believe the guy who started Roland's son, who is involved with it. Basically, I was at NAMM and they were doing a demo. And someone said to me, I'll go over into the corner of the thing. And there's this like A-Frame thing. And it's basically like, um, it literally is like a, a triangle of, of wood with a membrane. And on the back of it, it's got like a little sort of, you know, bit of a little control box basically and you strike and and like uh, yeah. rub your hand on the surface and you can you can put it under tension like there's a tensioning sort of membrane and it knows how much pressure you've put on it um and I, it, like a lot of things at nam you know you sort of walk around especially downstairs in hall e and it's, you, it's just the best spectator sport really it's like <laughs> just the weirdest stuff but and I, I initially was like, that's just fucking stupid. Like, that's just the, like, all right, mate, whatever. But I put the headphones on and it it was an extraordinary sounding thing. And as far as I can tell, it is basically a membrane and like a physical modeling engine yeah. strapped to the side of it. So it's that idea that with the combination of a microphone and the textures and the sort of, you know, obviously there's pressure too. But strap that to a physical modeling engine, yeah. and you've got something that was really 
it didn't sound like anything that I. It didn't. It sort of sounded like it was a. It was a percussion instrument, but not yeah. one that I'd ever heard. And they, they combined it with like loads of other things, probably, and reverb and. But it really. And does it awesome. feed back into the skin? I don't. Is that know. the other thing that would be yeah. really interesting? Is potentially. Like, yeah. I mean, there's probably a lot of there's probably different synth modes in it as yeah. well, but yeah. it's fundamentally you could tell that it was you were hearing part of the actual the memory yeah. itself. So it, it's very much. And I basically I was playing the thing. I was like, I sort of sat down and played with it, put it on, and did it. And the guy's like smiling. He's like, "What do you think?" I'm like, "This is incredible." I was like, "How much is it?" Yeah. And he's like, "It's fifteen hundred dollars." And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> "I knew you were going to say that." And then, but then I was like, "Shit, maybe the microphone and rings could." Yeah. Do it. And I've not really tried, and maybe that's. But I, I can think that only something like that would get Olivier so excited that he wanted to. Yeah. As a man who is like clearly into his physical modelling, it's yeah, yeah. It had to be yeah. so. But I don't know. Not tried it. So um, what I mean, obviously we're talking about microphone, but I do want to talk about the inception of of the Turing machine. Yeah. And what I mean, obviously written about it, but I've never heard you so talk about it. So it was. Uh, so I was in. I'd done little bits of DIY. So I got got into into Euro when somebody, a group of friends took me to an event that um, Post Modular did in Vauxhall. Uh, and I remember going along and then just talking to them about it and thinking this might be quite interesting. Mm. And it was at the time when um, uh, when Schneider's had a showroom in mm. Rough Trade. Indeed, in, yeah, in, I remember that. So you could... It was a time when you could actually go in and see this stuff easily, and I suppose you've got you've got um, London Modular now, so you can do the same over yeah. there. Yeah, um, and immediately I got uh, so I've been making kind of guitar pedals and stuff and Arduino and stuff, and as soon as I got it, I was interested in working out how to do little you know DIY things. So I built. Because so you kind of thought it would be surely it's easier. Like the appeal of Eurorack is that all the power size. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's an like, easy. It's a really easy. I mean, it's a platform, really. You yeah. know, and it's it, whereas making also making guitar pedals, you make a fuzz and you make a delay, and then you have to be really, really into fuzzes <laughs> to just keep <laughs> making more and more of them. It's the kind um, of the fuzz is a thing you can make badly, and it still sort of does. Yeah, its job. and I mean, and people get really, really obsessed with that, but I wasn't as interested in that as I was. So, so I made like a little sequencer, um, one of those Baby Eight sequencers. Um, made a little sort of Arduino clock thing for taking MIDI in and putting clock dividers out. Had you had you bought like a Euro system or you just bought Yeah, I bought I bought a, like a dub for case and a few bits and pieces. Um and and the thing and I had a, a pressure points and mm. and so it's kind of eight step sequencer. And the thing I realized I liked doing or the thing what I did was set up a random sequence had it playing and then kind of changed little bits and pieces as it was going along. Mm. And I thought, well, this is sort of pointless in that I have an, I have an interface that's suggesting like fine conscious changes. Mm. Like I'm sitting here setting these knobs in some position and all I'm doing is setting them randomly and then changing them and listening and, and that sort of thing. So I thought, is there a way of doing something that could do these loops automatically so i'm not pretending to make them do you mean uh, as in you didn't trust your own ability to like make good loops it just didn't just seem like, it just didn't seem like why could right. I, why should i do this when a machine could yeah do it, it, it was it was why am i why am i randomizing something <laughs> right for its when own sake a machine can randomize it but were you not and trying to just, make you weren't trying to make music as such i was making i was making loops of things you know i was make i was interested in that in that it wasn't it was. It just sort of didn't seem right that I was. I was using. The, you know, I felt like if I've got a sequencer that's got a whole row of knobs on it, I should be setting them in some conscious, deliberate way. Okay. And I wasn't. I was just setting them randomly and enjoying the results I was getting out of a out of a quantizer. Um, so I used the old Nord G two modular. Mm. The free, I used to have one, but I was using the free version of it to to prototype it because that's got shift registers it's got lots of logic in it that makes it quite powerful for that sort of thing and i suppose and i was looking at things like ken stone so ken stone has a module called the gated comparator which i still don't really understand how you're supposed to use it and what it's supposed to do what, for a musical purpose um yeah but it's a it, it's it's a weird 
complicated module, but when you looked at how it works, the actual, there's, there's chunks of that circuit that are in the Turing machine in terms of it's a shift register, uh, which is this kind of binary sort of loop of memory. Um, and also looking at things like the um, the Buchler source of uncertainty, mm. you could see things that that was doing, which again were kind of random and changing and quantized and, and something in that area. And I suppose I was listening to a lot of, um, you know, Steve Reich and Philip Glass mm. and that sort of thing at the time. So you had that idea of taking these kind of gradually changing loops and gradually changing sort the of key was the and key and is that they didn't change that often no as in that, that they were effectively looping but you were able to just just like a tap just allow a little yeah a little change to creep in so once i really once once i designed that it was then just saying how do you create something that does that but is simple and and sort of intelligible because mm. There are loads and loads of things that you can add onto it. There's loads of things that you can see and you start thinking, you know, I remember thinking about putting glide into it a lot and thinking, oh, I could have that. So it could sort of step between things. You could see lots of different possible outputs that you could have. But it was very, the, the trick was really just saying, uh, trying to work out how you can pare all that down and how you can get it as small and as simple and as minimal and mm. as... as as lightweight as possible. So you were consciously trying to design a product. It wasn't, you weren't, you know, if this was a, I like was a project designing for something, sake, it could have been as complicated as you wanted it to be. Yeah. I, yeah. I think I wanted something that I could share. So that was the point. I wanted something that I could, because I, I had shared projects by that stage. So I'd done, I actually did a spring reverb as well mm. that was shared. Um, and, you know, people react to it and people talked about it and people would make them, mm. you know, which was really exciting. So, yeah, so that was the first thing. That, 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 I'm trying to think how, in this world, like you just basically posted it on Mothwheeler and then yeah. had a, a little video of it making a little yeah. loop. And it was, it's it was just, exactly why, that. Is it, why did it take off? What was the, what? I mean, I don't, I don't know. I think part of it is that it's something you've made yourself. Um, I think part of it was we are in a world of repetitive electronic music. And it was very specifically designed for making it repetitive is, electronic music. It, is, it, it uh, is like that exemplar of techno. And this surgeon who uses the, yeah. the Turing machine and who he said, well, I, I can't remember the exact words, but words to the effect of that, you know, techno is just repeating randomness until yeah. it's no longer random, you know. Like any loop that the Turing machine makes, if you loop it more than once, yeah. it becomes deliberate. And that's something I found a lot with when I was reading about it. There was a thing I did later on, which was... Uh, thing for playing pianos so i was interested in this idea of loops is it your practice yeah, piano sort of, practice thing well there's that one there's a player piano one that's like that and it's like it's that box there see this um which is just an arduino with a midi output on it and some some knobs but the idea was to say the idea, the idea of that was so this plays the piano for you yeah that plays so the you piano don't need for to you. that's great exactly <laughs> I need one of those. and so the idea of that was was i was just really interested in that idea of how do you what is it? How do you make something that automatically plays? And what what I found really interesting with that was the the very first version of it was create a random whatever sixteen notes, pick a scale, or they were all just locked to a scale. Pick notes from that scale across different octaves. Uh, pick random velocities, and repeat it. And gradually change it so change mm. one note every every four bars or whatever and you do that and it sounds really really good if you <laughs> listen if you listen to it back to a recording of it it sounds really good and you're like well that's 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 Very quite awesome. nice yeah. because the the random velocity makes it feel like it has expression in it mm. and the the fact it's all in one scale makes it melodic and, and makes it make sense and, yeah and the re repetition means you can learn it and you can understand it and i and i then Thought, well, that's really exciting. Carried on working on it, trying to make it more and more complex and adding things like Markov chains that are supposed to make kind of self similar. Anything you added to it made it less interesting. Right. And you mean it the simpler did, it was, the better it was. Well, it did make me wonder that, and it was interesting when it came out recently with um, that story about Spotify and the relaxing piano music. Did you hear about no, this? No, no. So, Spotify have a playlist that is react like relaxing. Piano That's like music. one of their biggest it's, playlists. It's like Inaudi type stuff. Yes. 
And they they found somebody researched this and discovered that there were quite a lot of artists on there that don't exist anywhere else in the world. And they said their speculation is that Spotify have generated this music because they don't have to then play license to anyone else. And as soon as I read that, I was like, that is 100%. I'm amazed they even have a human being doing it. Because I've, literally, I have built. <laughs> you can not, with any particular programming skills, you really can produce something that makes pretty credible, relaxing piano music as much as you want, hours at a time. Mm. Very, and, and it was, and it, it does, you know, it did make me... Do you th- is that true then? Did they? Did they? I don't know how they produced it, but it was definitely. I and mean, they've denied it, but it was definitely a story that that there's a bunch of artists on there, and people are like, where do these artists exist? I think they might have a a homepage that looks a bit tenuous, like they've just. I, I can't remember the exact story, but it was. It, it did make me think that there is there is a certain amount of musical activity that. Is you can produce music that is really pleasant to listen to and mm-hmm. enjoyable, and I will enjoy listening to. It doesn't, but it doesn't actually need a human, and it doesn't need to be particularly clever either. And there's, no. there's a lot of people doing really, really sophisticated work about auto composition and auto. You know, they've been doing it for for decades, and I was just amazed that literally random notes and random velocities and repetition. Does it? But does it have to be slow to sort of? I think. You know what I mean? Like, I think you would. This, you, it's intolerable it a, if it was fast. What is that? What's that thing like when it's like high? Well, actually, when you do it really fast, it turns into noise, and it's quite interesting because you're, <laughs> you're <laughs> flowing, throwing notes into a piano. Um, what I've never Black done is midget. tried it with a um, with a proper uh, disclavier, yeah, yeah which would be. be incredible. That would be. <laughs> but um, you get to the, those like Heathrow Airport where there's yeah. one and just like sort of quickly like <laughs> exactly. <immediately. laughs> see if anyone notices, just stow it under the thing. Yeah. That's like... Um, but it was quite... It was definitely slightly disappointing. You just thought, well, actually, maybe quite a lot of this composition is is just repetition. Do you mean your composition in general is, well, is just more or less bunk? Or? Well, <laughs> not in that it's more or less bunk, in that it's in that there are things that go... You know, human... I mean, I suppose I particularly like repetitive music. Yeah, I've definitely. Always, I've, I've definitely <laughs> had no... You know, I, I can't think of any piece of music that I would say was boring. Because it was repetitive, you know, I can sit and listen to something very repetitive mm. for a very long time. Well, there is some, I again can't remember the exact quote, but there is a Brian Eno quote where he talks about, you know, even music that's repeating the same notes, it's different every time because yeah. it's different to us. So it's yeah. like it's not repeating, even though it is playing the same technical piece. It's well, like, there's actually that it reminds me. There's that uh, there's an amazing Brian Eno story about exactly this, where he um, takes a tape recorder out and records street noise while he's walking around Marble Arch, I think, and walks past the edge of like Speaker's Corner. He records whatever it is, four minutes of it. I think it's four minutes of its kind of pop song length. And then he listens to it over and over again. And he learns it and it becomes music because he knows what's coming. He oh, knows how it works. Yeah. He knows the sequence he's got, you know, and as far as he's concerned, because it has that repetition, even at that length, um, then it, yeah. it works. And there was a there was yeah. a study over in the other day about um, very difficult kind of classical, you know, um, just completely unrepetitive, very difficult to listen to, austere classical, you know, nineteen thirties, forties classical music, um, where they were playing that to students and just putting very simple loops in it, like you know, chopping the thing in half and repeating it uh, or putting very small, you know, chopping all of that and asking the students for their reactions to it. And literally the same piece of music just with loops artificially put into it, they said, oh, this is much nicer to listen to. I much Mm. more enjoy it without realising what had been done to the music. Mm. Yeah. So I think... Well, I I, I just think of the Turing machine. It's like, I know I like listening to loops and I know it works because I've literally done it and it's... That's how I make music is effectively, ultimately, you know, if you go to a piece of equipment or a piano, you are effectively just seeking some randomness that you make into a non-random thing by repetition. Yeah. It's it's exactly the same principle as as just asking a machine to do it. Yeah. And it's, that's why, I mean, the Turing machine is, I mean, of course it's musically valid, uh, mainly because it's, then it's the human that gets to decide what the loop is. You get to decide when to lock it. Yeah. Um, 
although I've never, to be honest, I've never really experimented with the whole CV locking, which I probably no, should. Which you can do, but it is quite fiddly to do. It's just, you but also, I just like, I like, I like to yeah. get to choose, that's sort yeah. of the point. Yeah. Um, but maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe it doesn't need me. <laughs> it doesn't need me to pick the loops. Well, I think people have done that where you just, you know, you, you set it off and leave it and then it will play forever and it mm. will change. And I think, it's not especially good for doing that, but you can do it where it will change every, you know, 16 bars. Because uh, you thing, just leave it to it. Also, the thing I find about the, the Turing machine is that it's not quite... The patterns it makes are not random. It has its own little, like, idiosyncrasies and cadences. So that's be- I sometimes got annoyed yeah. with mine. I thought it was yeah. broken. So I was like, why do you keep doing that? Where it's like... Little, so that's little, because little. of the, um, the analog to digital conversion. So that's because... Essentially, if you imagine one bit, kind of, you've got eight bits which it's converting. So it's taking it's taking eight bits and turning into numbers. So if, if all eight bits are lit, it's kind of one 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 one, which in binary is like two hundred and fifty six. I think so this makes a really high or sixty four or to, either way, it's it's a big number. If none of them are lit, it's zero. And is that what it's doing? So it's, whenever it's it gets, whenever it samples, it's looking at all of whether the lights are on or off. It's looking things, if they're on or off, and reading that as a Adding them number. up, yeah. and then making a, a CV value based Yeah, on and it that. adds them up, not in a... So the one on one end will be like 64, and one on the other end will be 1. Oh, so because they, they kind of, have it's, influence. Yeah, yeah so, it's, so it's... They've so sliding scale. Because of that, if you have one spot moving across, it will always move up in a particular scale. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I then did the Volts Expander, which doesn't have that. So the Volts Expander will produce quite different melodies and it won't sound the same. Okay. <laughs> what, yeah, because I, I still don't really understand how Volts works. So Volts, dark, Volts so. takes, well, I mean, that's exactly how it does work and that's the <laughs> real point of it. But Volts takes five of those steps and creates a digital to analog converter where you set the values for the steps. So you could so program nice. volts to do exactly the same as the the main bit, but you obviously don't. Okay. Uh, and, and I like it because it's, you also just, you've got one more bit to, you can kind of mold the pattern mm. slightly more than you could otherwise. Um, I think it's probably similar to that, um, what's that big massive sequence of the, um, there's another enormous DIY project, which is a, an enormous the clay, the clay, 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 yeah. clay. I think I that, that works. Or what that is. Yeah. Like, I always think it seems interesting, but yeah. I don't know why. I think that is like a massive um, version of Volts. Okay. Possibly. Sounds good. <laughs> I'd like one. Yeah. Do you? I mean, do you make music with this stuff as well? Just to be. That was one thing I was going to ask. I will. I you will are... record things. <laughs> uh, and you know, I did things like I did a. I did an article about using an algorithm to generate a score that you can then play from. So oh, yeah, I did yes, that, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that was some music that I recorded. I mean, mm. music is pushing it a little bit. Wow. Um, but I will, I will, it, it, I'll be making things that I want to play with. Mm. So that's always, the, so, so with, with, um, with radio music, it was very much, I was really interested in this idea of a, an automatic, a, a CV controlled radio. So I built a CD yeah, control radio. Pres- yeah, build an actual CD. Yeah, so I built one, um, which I can show you if you want. Yeah. So I find it, get it out as a prop. Yeah, of course. Um, so that oh my God, look is in here. It's just like full of, it's like a graveyard of music thing. That is literally music the things. <laughs> it's where the music things are. So that was the CV controlled radio, which was a little radio chip from a German kind of kit. Uh, and then just is this like FM or AM? that was FM, yeah, uh, and it worked really well in here <laughs> uh, because I'm I'm in I'm in sort of near Brixton, yeah. There were pirate Pirates stations. Radio, yeah. You would get quite interesting stuff, and it and it again when you sequence it, it is really interesting because you just get these bits of town that come in from nowhere. Yeah, it's great. When you start running it through kind of delays and things, it's it's really interesting. Uh, and I remember taking that down to the uh, Brighton Modular Meets one year, 
I'd been quite you know pleased with my new invention. Yeah. Uh, and that it's in a different venue from where it is now. And the venue it was in was a Faraday cage. It is the so it was literally yeah, yeah. this room with just sheet metal at the top and the bottom all around it. I don't know, and there was nothing there. There was no signal at all. Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> uh, and so I sort of realised that that was. You know, I think there's something very beautiful about like it's, it's also it reminds me of the um, RF Nomad. You know? Yeah. And yeah. that 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 can, in all honesty, be a very frustrating module if yeah. you live somewhere where there's no signals. But yeah. there is an incredible beauty in the idea that you can only make music with the the sound that is around you. Yeah, it just is a deeply frustrating. Beauty. Well, that was there it, and that like, was, and there is a there's a fantastic. Uh, so John Cage did a lot of this stuff in the in the fifties, uh, where he would do compositions for like twelve radios. And you'd have 12 people, six people on stage, two radios each, and they would have very specific instructions about how to move the dials, set the volume up and the volume down, and that would be the composition. But was that that was that based on a knowledge that there was anything on those frequencies? So, just, so not did, at all. How did he arrive at that? And so there was a there was a, a, a story of he he performed, I think, in Italy, and for various reasons the concert was delayed and kept putting back, so it was getting put back later into the evening. And I think it was like 11, 12 o'clock when he came to perform. And in Italy at the time, the radio stations all went off the air at about 11 o'clock. Oh, and so, and being him, he was like, this is fine. You know, this is, and also it's all, all random operations. So quite often the volume was so low on the radio, you wouldn't be able to hear it anyway. <laughs> Never mind right. that it wasn't tuned into anything. So for him, this was... This was fine. We could do a concert. And then it was totally legitimate. And he actually, and actually, I think the piece that of his that's called radio music was his response to this. And he said, "Well, I, I kind of rewrote a different version that was generally a bit louder because people were annoyed <laughs> by right. it being just too pointless." Cage uh, just generally like upset people at his yeah. concerts. I think there's a lot of crit like things to be said. I don't know how you would do that. How would you actually upset audiences now to that extent? I think it'd be very difficult. It would be... Are we too jaded or are we just expecting... Uh, I don't know. Do you know what I mean? It's like, how could you... Well, I mean, you'd have to use politics. You'd have to use... Yeah. <laughs> you know. But Tune I think... to LBC. It's yeah. like the Farage shows on. Being too extreme would be quite difficult musically, mm. I think. I don't, I don't I mean, there will be things that will... I did see... I, I saw an artist the other day who performed and for the first full sort of six or seven minutes, like which is a long time when you're there, it was just one arpeggio, or it's like a stair step. And then just that repeated, possibly someone will be able to work out what that was now, but it's just literally that. And and all I think he was doing was applying a little bit of delay to go with it, because he was playing with a laptop, he had an album to promote, and... He had that, and then he had a black box with stickers on it, you know, which I looked at, I was like, oh, it must be a Euro rack, but it wasn't. And I think it pretty much just had like one delay pedal in it, as far as I'm concerned. And it was, you know, I'm just there. There's a point where it's sort of almost like, is there something wrong? But then when you look at the, the eyes, they're absolutely like bugging out and having a great time, yeah. except it's just literally playing back. Um and it's that whole, like, you know, as Peter Kern has talked about, the just press play, you know, and Dead yeah. House has as well. It's like, actually, in fairness, that is something that, in, but that infuriates me, but I, I'm a musician, or I shouldn't call myself a musician. I'm a person who makes music, yeah. but I, you know, it pisses me off. And that actually is when you're not doing anything. Do you know what I mean? And but I that's I'm, a very specific, because you can, you know, you can, Go to. I mean, anyone who's ever been to see a DJ playing knows that is a extremely valid way of entertaining a room Absolutely. full of people. One hundred percent. And it's so, just, but it depends what's on the you know what's yeah. on the ticket. You know, am I going to a DJ set or does it say live? And if it says but live, that's then a it very be specific, live. you know, interest. I mean, that's a very tiny subset of the audience, isn't it? And, and the people and as a way of ent- yeah, as a way of entertaining the audience. Even that whole thing of you know when you when you get pictures of here's a DJ and then somebody points out that their their turntable's not actually plugged in, plugged in and it's yeah. all coming off a memory stick. Uh, if they they may well be entertaining and uh, the crowd may be enjoying it. Yeah, you know, and and it's who are we to say that's not a 
a valid thing to do. I know. Yeah, <laughs> that it just it like it sends me under. But yeah, it, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. Because if you have no idea, then why would you care? But then it's just—is it subterfuge or does it even matter? And maybe like you know, I think about it myself as like developing a live system, you know, which is based on improvisation. It's like, am I just wasting my time? And actually, like, you're only going to annoy audiences by having a bad day. Like, as in, if you just yeah. don't manage to catch a good loop on the Turing machine, then it's like, you know, you have a bad gig. Yeah. But people wouldn't even realise the risk that you put yourself yeah. in and or give a shit. And it's like, all they want to hear is good music. So you're doing it for yourself. You're not doing it for them. Yeah. And that's fine. But, I mean, I think... But that, like all, like, you know, slightly narcissistic <laughs> people, you want people to enjoy themselves also. It's like... But you do want... You, you want an audience to have a good time, I suppose. It's just... Um, I don't know. It, that, for me, is a bugbear born from from kind of the Just Plus Play kind of school of thought. But I just don't know if I'm... You know, this is my own personal cross, but it's like whether it's even worth bothering. Perhaps we should just design the set and just make sure it's good. Yeah. You know I mean, as in just... Yeah, yeah. It's just all done, and you just do kind of press play. And then maybe you just put all your efforts into putting on some kind of show, like... You know, yeah. Dancing, dancing, yeah. dancing like horses and just other <laughs> things. You know, like I've seen like bands that I don't like that much, but I've really enjoyed the show because of the visuals or like the. But the there, are, I mean, there, there is another side of that if you've got the right audience. So I saw, um, I saw Russell Haswell at, mm. at the Brighton Modular Meet mm. has an audience that is exactly that, and it's him standing in the back of the room with a laser, uh, and it was literally him playing waveforms and i really you know really enjoyed it i was like this is fantastic this is exactly what this is this is something you can only do with this stuff with a modular crowd yeah to a modular not, crowd do you think or yeah just well i don't know whether it's too much i mean you know i was i can only speak for what I, how i reacted to it which was that it was just a perfect thing for that audience in that moment yeah and it definitely wasn't something you would you know it would be you obviously could do that sitting there having a laptop sequencing through these things, but knowing that it wasn't quite that and the, the level of kind of chaos and weirdness in it made it felt like quite a kind of it was a brilliant craft like, activity. That absolutely, yeah. When it, it was like an appropriate use of modular technology yeah. in a sense, like it's something it does really well. Yeah, but then there are other people who will want to do something much more sequenced and controlled. And I thought, I mean, the other the the really fascinating one I saw at um, a loop in Berlin saw uh, Susan Kiani playing and she said that she essentially programmed her sequencer in like 1976 1978 programmed a particular sequence of notes into the big sequencer she had and she has been living inside that set of notes ever since and everything she does so uses good. that structure of notes. And when she went away and she got a new one, she had to then program that same structure of notes into it. And it means whenever she plays, it sounds like her. Mm. Um, and I thought that was just amazing as a kind of... As a, yeah, yeah, that you have a chord or like a... Sort of, and why not? Like, yeah. there's obviously... A, she's combining them in different ways. There's obviously like a myriad of things to explore. Yeah. The other example of that is um, I'm looking at like, you know, do you know Stevio? Like the guy, it's like a sort of kind of modular techno guy but it's more like i'll send you some of his music but it's, it's amazing he, he's doing a completely improvised system but effectively the way that he does it is he tunes all his oscillators to a kind of chord yeah you know and that and then it basically jams closes they're all each oscillator goes through a filter yeah closes all the filters down and then it's just about um different ways to like send gates different logic see, gate yeah. patterns yeah just to open those filters yeah to let the notes pop through and then also he's sending shifts and offsets to them. Oh, yeah, yeah. But it fundamentally is, it's like find your chord yeah. and then kind of groove around that chord for an hour. You know? Yeah. And, he, and he's, don't think he's, he's not retuning them mid-set, at least I don't think he is tremendously. So it's, it's kind of a similar idea. Um, although so, and the other thing with Suzanne Ciani is when she's playing, it's in quadraphonic sound yeah. as well, which is amazing. Yeah. Which I'd never expect. Like I saw a play at Moogfest and it was like I'd never experienced anything like that where... Holy crap! Like it's yeah. such a, it's sort of it's the kind of thing that if I thought about it ahead of time, I was like, kind of think it's like a bit of a cliche yeah. or it's a twee sort of notion. But actually, yeah. when you experience it, it's an extraordinarily beautiful and an immersive way to experience that sort of music. It's, it's yeah, much I saw better than um, stereo. 
I saw Keith Fullerton and Whitman at Cafe Otto doing that in quadraphonic. Mm. And yeah, it was just an amazing thing. It's great. And it's like, it's something that a modular can do very well, I think, in the sense yeah. that you can send it control voltages. And if you've got enough output, it's very easy to swirl things around. And, and the very. Create a sound, an immersive space to live in. And so the. the, um, the I did a talk at Machines in Music that was about the kind of early days of Buchler in San Francisco when he was doing the sound for like when the Grateful Dead started, mm. his kind of acid trip stuff. Like the sound for the box. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and what I hadn't realized was that that was fundamentally what the thing was used for. So um, the first thing he built for David Tudor was. Uh, it was exactly that. It was to send different signals to different speakers, and it had a kind of touch plate that would allow him to to ping speakers, ping stuff around the room. Mm. So it was that that quadraphonic thing was right. I don't know how many speakers it was, but it was that that thing was right there at the very beginning of that. That's interesting. And almost before thinking about oscillators and you know filters and that sort of thing, it was take existing sound off tape and ping it around the room. Signal distribution. And was, was yeah, very game. and that was obviously a, a massive part of that psychedelic, you know, if you put a whole bunch of people in the room with the Grateful Dead playing <laughs> and they're all on acid. Yeah. It's still legal to nineteen sixty eight. And the Grateful Dead are playing through a buckler system, which I think may not be exactly how it worked, but it's that sort of thing. Mm. Uh, you know, this crazy sort of thing was, was so different from the way people are using it now and doing stuff with it now. Mm. Yeah, there's certainly no rules back then. It's like none of there were no tropes or conventions with the yeah. way those things were meant to be used. The signal distribution thing is interesting. It's like, is it is? I don't really know many artists at all who are doing things like that, other than actually outside of galleries where. Yeah. Actually, funny. It was I was. Um, Oh, it was at Superbooth. Um, I got out for a day and went to the, um, I forget the name of the gallery that's basically the old train station, but they had a bunch of sound-based things in there, some really nice things, including one where um, it was basically like 12 sort of 30-foot wooden kind of bars yeah. with speakers, just passive speaker cones wired in, and then just, you know, actual bra or whatever brass, you know, Speaker wire, yeah, and then each row was basically one speaker, you know right? I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. and then there was a there was some kind of signal distributor, and you would walk down this column, which was so it was sort of twelve very long speakers that you were yeah. walking down a tunnel, and it would have birds fluttering, doing loops around. You oh know, wow! Yeah, like this really yeah. kind of like extraordinary sort of sounding thing, um, and it did get me thinking. I was just like, this is this is really nice, and it's something that you can't, we can't. You know, we've all got really good speakers. We've all got really good headphones. We can kind of replicate a loud music experience, yeah. but we can't replicate an immersive music no. experience short of buying five Genelx. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. Actually, but who bothers? Like, yeah. the um, actually, in, like I was just thinking about with, um, yeah, with Steve Reich, where it's like, I've got that um, 5.1 I bought the five. Oh right, yeah. And I've like I've no way of playing yeah. it. <laughs> but I was like, I must own this. And in fact I ripped all of the channels yeah. out separately. So I've got them all separated. Yeah. And I'm meant to do things with them and play and really just set it up and play it, but I've not yeah. done it yet. Because I thought I was like the best idea ever. I was like, yeah. I can't believe you've done this. It's brilliant. Yeah. Because it's I would love to live inside music for eighteen musicians, basically. That yeah. would be like <laughs> So the other thing I did when I was in, in New York was went to uh went to see Lamont Young playing. So Lamont, Lamont Young <laughs> is the composer who really started that whole kind of minimalist thing off. So in 1958, he was at uh, Berkeley and he wrote a thing called Trio for Strings. And the first note of Trio for Strings lasts for four and a half minutes. And it has no vibra vibrato in it and it is just long, long, long drones that goes on for an mm. hour, creating different kind of chords as it goes. Um, and it was completely sort of static, but changing very, very slowly over so time. So it's very, very slow. It's not like four organs or something where it's No, it's jazz like, if you imagine a like... very, very, if you imagine four organs at kind of <laughs> Through 16 stretch. speed or something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> um, and he then, he then uh, went to 
to Darmstadt with Stockhausen. He met John Cage. He moved to New York and he started doing these um, kind of uh, text compositions. So he would have compositions like um, uh, one is it has a picture of a chord, two notes, like a simple fifth chord, and it just says hold for a very long time. <laughs> is the composition brilliant? One of them is you know. Uh, release butterflies in the room Man, there's a piece he wrote for david shooter which was uh feed a bale of hay to a piano <laughs> <laughs> so he did a lot of play it as well so just, no you literally it. just and the instructions are you feed it and if it eats it it's got certain instructions if it doesn't it's got other instructions <laughs> and he was then curating uh yoko and his loft in kind of 1960 62 and then in 1960 or something he set up this thing called the dream house which was in a loft in in new york uh and it was a series of oscillators playing sine waves in a house that ran for four years amazing playing these notes the same notes the same notes okay for four <laughs> years uh and essentially that experience still exists now Okay. So 275 um, Church Street in Manhattan. Uh, it's one of these tall buildings, got kind of pizza restaurants at the bottom. The second floor <laughs> is... I was going to say, do the property values drop I, I think, severely? I think, <laughs> I think it's not that loud. If you think okay, cool. So this, the second floor is his flat where he lives with his wife. They live on a five-day-a-week schedule. So their week is the normal length of time. But they have days that are like something like twenty four hours on and twelve hours off. So they have only five days during a week, and that's how they live. They live in that in that world. Okay. Then the third floor is their performance space, which is the dream house, and the fourth floor is is his archives. And he's now eighty two, and he he still plays. So I I wanted to go and visit it when I was in New York and rang up and you know emailed them and said, "Are you open?" And they said, "Oh no, we're not open because we've got a." a show on Saturday night. So I went on to the show. It was about 35, 40 people turn up and it's kind of white carpets and they're really strict about, you know, you're not allowed to talk, you're not allowed to take any pictures. Um, and you sit down and there is a drone playing throughout the whole house. Uh, which so this is, is at the house. This is at the, in the, in the place. Uh, and there's all these kind of purple and magenta lights. There's a 77 sine wave drone playing and it's also got six channels of kind of voices kind of mixed into it this kind of and it's it's a lot of it's kind of indian raga kind of thing and then eventually we're all sat there kind of cross-legged on the floor and then they come in and they sit and perform and it's it's lamont young his wife his kind of protege who's a bit younger uh two guitarists playing fretless guitars uh and a tabla player and they just play the drone carries on and they improvise over the, over drone. the drone and then after about 45 minutes which is quite uncomfortable to be sitting <laughs> on the floor uh, it was very hot because they don't have air conditioning because it's too noisy and one of the things is the drone is based around uh 60 hertz okay and Lamont Young says that he now uses digital synthesizers to generate the, the sound. Uh, and he sometimes gets annoyed because the uh, 60 hertz mains hum is often not actually 60 hertz. And that interferes with the drones. <laughs> it's like discordance. When he, when he plays in Europe, the whole thing is transposed to be based on 50 hertz. That's to make sure, make sure it doesn't interfere with the with the, the um, buzz killing out the, the speakers. Buzz, yeah. That's amazing. Um, so yeah, after after about forty five minutes, you know, builds the clients and stops, and then they all they process out, and, and it was absolutely extraordinary. I mean, it was as a, it was as a, good. It, it was, was it was transcendent. It, it was, was I, I wouldn't. Was it? it was an amazing thing to go to. Right. Okay. And it was like I mean, the difference between some you know, you get artists who are. Um, so he so doesn't compromise in any way. Mm. So, you know, Philip Glass is making Hollywood movie soundtracks. Steve Reich will turn up and do clapping music at mm -hmm. any venue he's invited Wait, to yeah, <laughs> yeah, still now. I'll have um, to go see him. Yeah, which I will go and see, and he's yeah, wonderful as well. He, 
essentially, I mean, he's played, I think he's played once in Britain in the last 25, 30 yeah. years. In 1997, I think, uh, his wife got ill and it was kind of height of Britpop and a bunch of bands like Pulp clubbed together and did a benefit for him at the Barbican or Royal Festival Hall or somewhere. And he refused to give permission for any of his work to be performed at it. Brilliant. <laughs> I'm brilliant. <laughs> So the, the, to benefit his wife. Uh, yeah, I That's, think he did then come over and play like a year later. But <laughs> okay, but you know he is. There, there, there is all compromise. You can't movies. hear any of his there music is. because it's not recorded. Or it's not recorded. Right. I mean, bits of it are recorded, but none of it's published. He he absolutely doesn't give permission to music to be played anyway. So they did in the in I think the Barbican did a big history of American minimalism a few years ago, and on the schedule it had various of his pieces when they came to form and said we haven't got permission to do these we're not allowed to do any of them so he's completely not a long and essentially if you want to see him you go to 275 house. church street his house new place uh, and, it, and i mean it's amazing that he and his his status is you know he, if you if you look back at the history it really did start with him you know and People like Brian Eno are like, he is the well that it all comes from. Um, so, and he's still there. But it's like I can't, I don't know how to hear his music other than go there. No, I can't look Some anymore. of it's on, there are there are bootlegs and there's stuff on YouTube. You can hear kind of trio for strings on YouTube. He did this, comp this composition called uh, The Well-Tuned Piano, where he got a like eight foot, whatever, Bosendorfer piano, the ultimate biggest one. And he tunes it to, what's the other tuning? Not just intonation or whichever the one that's not, the, the one that the proper, you know, there's, there's the one that we all use and there's the other tuning. Mm, I don't know, yeah. He tunes the whole thing to the other tuning. Um, uh, it's not equal temperament. Equal temperament is okay. the one we all have. Yeah, he tunes the other thing. We have the compromise. Yeah, he has, the, the, compromise. He has the pure, and it does sound amazing when you hear it because it does sound like a piano, but it's like incredibly bright and just somehow the, 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 sounds I, very different. The only thing I understand about it is, well, I don't understand at all, but I, I heard there's a, a guitar that has weird frets yeah. where it's been tuned in that way. It's like it's there's exactly no compromise that, yeah. to the tuning. Yeah. It's been tuned like. Not like, I still don't, I cannot wrap my head around what it is. So the way it works is it's things like if you play, and I don't know enough music, things like if you play a third under our tuning, it always has a bit of a kind of shimmer to mm. it that's not quite in tune. The way a fifth is perfectly in tune yeah. and there's no oscillation, I think a third is always slightly out of tune. It's average, basically. Because that means you can it play work. it in any key. Right. As I understand it, if you're using the other one, which I can't remember what it is, <laughs> um, you can only play in a certain key, but things like sevenths are completely perfect and thirds are completely perfect and it generally just sounds much clearer and purer. So he did. He got this piano and then he, he did multiple performances of a five and a half, six hour long improvisation nice. on it, nice. which there is, a, there is an album of it that costs about... Fifteen hundred dollars oh, on just um, dogs. <laughs> if you track it down, so like in the Alan Strange book, if you like, yeah, you find a copy. It's like a billion pounds. Yeah, it's, it's like exactly that. One on Amazon. <laughs> oh, God, that's I, uh, yeah, that is amazing. I do like the idea of people who are just ruthlessly uncompromising and in no way sort of pandering to any notion of sort of fame, celebrity, or yeah. like you know are trying to appeal to people, that people just yeah. have a ruthless vision that they stick to, and it's like, screw the world if you like. All his concerts say in big letters, this is not entertainment. <laughs> not this one, but the one, the one I played in London, I was all played through, and he says this. And I think when he did the stuff at Yoko and his lofts, it was like, this is not for entertainment. Did he make, he says that. It's, yeah, it's I think that's in, I think that was in the, the kind of program. With the other, and, and it's, you know, he. Has that's a, quite entertaining as a, a thing to say. Yeah. I think you must realise the irony. <laughs> <laughs> We're not meant to enjoy this. No. Is he making a, is he making a statement? Is he, do you think he's. I, I think he, he is. Being whimsical well, something. he clearly has a sense of humour. You can tell from those compositions in 1960. But. Uh, uh, he is. He does seem to be extremely serious. Did you? you and, and his, speak to him, presumably. No, no, I didn't speak to him. I mean, his, so there's a. Um, I think Jeremy Grimshaw wrote a, a biography of him, 
and he like worked with him and lived with him and stuff and knew him really well and when the book was coming to con its conclusion they completely fell out and now there is an entire website that is Le Moyne Young and all of his associates explaining what a terrible and wrong book this is and why it should never have come out brilliant god I wonder if I'll be like in compromising like that. It's like I think about um yeah. like, you know, when I'm that age, I wanna be tinkering on a like music easel and yeah. two hundred E just in my corner, playing with Ableton. Yeah. That's like a sort of grey haired old man. I yeah. think I do think that like as in the musical I don't know, I, th I think I feel that old age will be a lot more entertaining. Because we just have better equipment now. Yeah. We have better toys. <laughs> and there's a lot to be explored. Like, we yeah. definitely haven't gotten to the bottom of music. I think that's fair to say. Although I don't know what future music styles look like. It's actually something I was going to ask you about, which was not music, because I don't think it's possible to work out what the future of music is going to sound like. But these things may be related. It's like, what do you think is the, f what is the future of music technology... And it's kind of what is what is both good and bullshit about the current state of music technology. Because I think music technology is what's going to inform what music becomes. It obviously, it does already inform what music becomes because it limits your equipment, limits you. you, know, you can, if you have a guitar, you make guitar music, or do you? I think, I mean, I think the, the thing I find interesting about music gear is that it's so, it's like, the reason people play electric guitars is always going to be, you know, 5% the sound what it lets them do and 95% other things. And for different people, it's different things. Some, you know, the, the entire history of kind of pop music is people looking cool playing guitars. Yeah. <laughs> or the whole economics of that is people reaching their 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s and being able to buy the things they wanted when they were 13 and 14. Mm. And I think that's where it gets so interesting kind of culturally and interesting as a thing to talk about and interesting as a thing to be involved in is because just this enormous world of baggage that is around it that is constantly interesting. And the reason why people want things is interesting. The reason why people use things is interesting but the actual, the actual core of the technology does feel like it's got incredibly advanced and sophisticated and optimised within computers. So if you're wanting to make music that sounds interesting and strange and unusual, you will be doing it on a computer and it will be very much more strange and much more unusual. Uh, and, you know, the experimental music you know art music or computer music that it, and experimental music is often far more far out if it's in that computer world oh, and i think this makes me think of orteca and the, yeah so russell haswell was playing yeah. with orteca it's like and that was definitely computer music yeah and, and it's extraordinary and they may be also and i think for making music yourself it's often much more enjoyable to have an interface to play with it's much more enjoyable to have something that makes you happy when you look at it it's much more enjoyable to have all of those things which is why people do it. But the actual real future of it, it feels like it's late to be that. I mean, I thought the 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 Google deep learning with sound stuff that came out last year was just extraordinary where they were synthesizing and creating sound waves in real time based on learning other things. So you feed it a bunch of piano music and it's not playing samples, it's not listening to it. It is literally synthesizing something that sounds like music according to what it's learnt. And you listen to it and it sounds like piano music, but really strange because it doesn't understand some of it. You feed it speech and it sounds like people talking, but you can't you don't understand their words and you can't quite place their accent and you can't quite make sense of it. And so there are things in that in terms of how you will be able to edit sound, how you'll be able to create sound differently that that feel like, I suppose it's, you remember when things like Auto-Tune first came out, which was 
I think invented by a guy or it was either geologist. You know, yeah, the geologist. Yeah, so geologist. <laughs> people studying, you know, sonic stuff going on the ground. So it became very, very good at manipulating waveforms. And one of them said, actually, we can do this with with um, with sound. And I can remember 10 years ago really looking at, is it possible to do polyphonic pitch shifting and to feed something a chord and then go into the chord and move things up and down? And at the time, it was simply impossible and people couldn't see how it could be possible. Uh, it seemed like, you know, the whole problem of polyphonic transposition trans transcription seemed to be a problem might just not ever be solved and then that was solved you know about five years ago or so I still am in here. Um, yeah and so there will be breakthroughs like that that may well just slip into and, and things like that will have slipped very very quickly into popular music I think now. Mm. So when you listen to the music that's on Radio one there is an incredible arsenal of kind of firepower going into that into making this extraordinary layers of kind of polish and the extraordinary just kind of manipulations of it. And I don't much enjoy listening to that myself, but if I was wanting to study where that that edge is, at the moment it does feel quite a lot like that would be, you know, there's a lot of the, the journey from a lab somewhere to a hit record is probably quite effortless and quite, quite fast mm. at the moment. People's appetite for equipment is so vociferous. And yeah. it's, it's it's easier than ever to learn about it. Yeah. If someone does have a good idea, it's very quick before, you know, it's not long before everyone's got a hold of it and is yeah. actually yeah. iterating and, and using it. And I think yeah, but I mean I think in terms of hardware it's very different. I think in terms of hardware you you the the thing that's been amazing is just how the barriers to entry have have fallen so so fast. And this kind of the, the it's the sort of smartphone dividend all of the infrastructure that's been built in china to make you know incredible smartphones that cost 30 quid and have a supercomputer and a full color touch screen now mean anything that uses anything like that is is easy and the chips that are in all the digital modules we have now the screens in the digital modules we have now all come from that <laughs> that dividend uh, and i think the challenge then is working out how to build the interfaces and the things to make it to make it useful. I would also posit suggestively that then it's it's the onus is on the the equipment designers to l- suggest the new ways of using equipment yeah. by designing interfaces. Is yeah. it's almost you know in the same way that like a three hundred three begats three hundred three style music. Yeah. Is that that because you've designed something a certain way that it just suggests a use and it's. And if yeah. the equipment designers are designing truly unusual instruments, I'm thinking of like, you know, um, you know, Seat Lombard or however yeah. it's pronounced, that yeah, kind yeah. of thing where it's just like, when you look at it, you're like, what the fuck is this? Yeah. That those things, you know, that, that it's the designer that can, that can inadvertently create new forms of music by, yeah. the, by suggesting new ways to use equipment. And I think when you get into that, that world of computer music it is it is very much how do you take that power and turn it into something useful and you see things i mean something like the dx7 algorithm that fm algorithm that that Chowning created and yamaha licensed that still nobody's come up with a useful interface for that you know that was a, an extraordinary piece of sound generating equipment in the in the 80s um, but it wasn't a sound shaping interface mm. particularly, and there is a an unsolved problem to be solved there. You know, nobody's actually you know, and, and I think the idea that having three hundred knobs to control it is somehow solving the problem isn't solving the problem. Uh, and I think when you get into that computer music, that that is the issue over and over and over again. Is if you're if you've got genuinely new ways of creating sound. Like the the sort of granular stuff is the same. Nobody's come up with a solution for how do you really make that useful as an interface in the in the in the right way. You know, mm. I think that's where you know Olivier had frustrations with what he did with the clouds mm. that he clearly People are not didn't using feel this the was, way that I feel is well. He I think he just didn't feel he'd solved that problem. It goes back to that thing of saying how do you make it 
small and simple and easy. And going back to talking about radio music, that was, if you're making a sampler, you can obviously see a million different things that you can put in a sampler. And there are a million different features and you see these sampler devices that have got multiple screens and multiple controls, and multiple ins and multiple outs. I just wanted to go completely the other way and say literally how how much can you take out of it? How can you get it so it's it's literally just whatever the minimum is? And then I think it's about learning how you patch into it and patch mm-hmm. out of it. It's yeah, saying you learn what, like how... what's actually useful within it. It's, yeah, you've limited the parameters enormously, but then it's almost like a little puzzle as a musician. I remember like playing with the radio music for the first time and going like, mm, like, <laughs> being like, oh yeah, if I do this, then yeah. you can get time stretching and stuff yeah. by like having multiple repeat time and slowly scrubbing. Yeah. Um, or you can load it up with a bunch of, of loops the same length and start fading between them, and you can. And mm. there's there's things you can you can do with it, but you because it's limited, you're able to learn it and you're able to get. All of it, I think. You're able to master it in a way yeah. that you can't with DX7 because it's there's too many parameters. Well, it's a difficult thing to, yeah. It's a it's and I think with DX7 it's more the actual physical kind of UX of the interface. It's like even if and I I found with the little the Volker FM, mm. you start playing with it. Well, it's not actually that complicated you know you're always given no, this not. idea it's that really doing six, anything with fm was completely yeah, impossible six envelope generators but actually yeah pitches. you can start playing with it and go okay i can see this but it's you're doing it through a letterbox the thing like um yeah i just could return to Orteca is like almost certainly or it seems that their live show you know and i'm supposing this but like you listen to it and it just it sounds like algorithms controlling fm engines yeah so effectively what that you know maybe the solution is that you then have your your army of algorithms and you give yourself five macro controls to yeah. sort of operate and let the machine do the hard work yeah. the hard complex work yeah so that you can you can just give it an instruction say make that color or that shade and it will fly off and yeah. turn all of the adjust all the dials for you adjust yeah. all the numbers and essentially that's what any digital module is doing you know any control can be controlling as many different parameters mm. as you want it to be controlling at once. It's just, but surely design, it's designing the ranges. It's making it so make means, sense, yeah. yeah. And yeah. so that, so as a musician, you then, you you learn via muscle memory how to get certain sounds. I think like, as one brilliant example of that is like the herb verb. Yeah. You ever play with that, it's that seven dials, but it's it just it, like every dial has such a clearly defined sonic purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Like I could close my eyes and you could say to me what type of reverb you would like and I will be able to get you a very good yeah. effort at that reverb type. I mean, that in some ways is what I think is really interesting is the difference between something that people can get emotionally invested in and get excited by and want to have. And afford. And afford rather than something, or not afford. You know, I mean, that's the other thing. Is if you can create, and I think it's really interesting when you look at the big companies like the Fenders and people who you can buy a legal Stratocaster made by them from what about 150 quid to about six grand, yeah. and the cheaper ones will have a Squire label on it, and the more expensive ones will have a Fender label on it. But they have that entire range from top to bottom that they own, they control, and there are lots of competitors that make the same thing, but they're not allowed to call it Stratocaster. Mm. Um, and I think it's so interesting that model compared with what we're in at the moment where Moog will make a mini Moog and just one mm-hmm. and it'll cost you whatever it costs. Three and a half grand. Three and a half grand. Uh, but then, but they're leaving it to, to Behringer to say, we're going to make the 300 quid one. Mm. It feels like there's a lot that people in our world can learn from how those big proper companies have been operating for years. And just seeing what what how do you give people what they want to buy at the price they want to buy it, rather than saying okay everything is going to cost this up here. I think you know in in Eurorack I think there's, it's different because we're all tiny tiny companies, but with Eurorack obviously the great innovation there is that it's for part work. <laughs> you buy one one at a time as you go along. Mm. Um, it almost it almost seems affordable yeah. as, as you go. <laughs> so when you turn back and see yeah. the thing in the corner, you're like, oh, yeah. when Absolutely. you come to insure it, yeah. you have a terrible, terrible afternoon. Yes. <laughs>
Cool. Cool. Thanks, Tom. All right. Thanks for your time. Good. Cheers. <laughs> So, that was me and Tom in the garden shed in Hearn Hill following some chicken. Well, I got the chicken. Uh, Tom had had a nice dinner in his house. What a dude. I love the story about Lamont Young especially. The whole, this is not entertainment, absolutely killed me. What an absolute G that man is. Just literally zero Fs given. A man who is not operating on the normal sort of plane. So that draws us to a close. Please check out Tom's projects. There's lots to point you at. Obviously, go to, if you Google music thing, I would encourage you to try and go to Tom's Medium page where he has a bunch of really interesting articles that he's written covering a great many topics. He is obviously a very interesting person to read. And I think the other th main thing is check out his latest project. If you're a modular person, he's got a brand new Spring Reverb that he's extremely, extremely proud of, justifiably. Check that out. It's on at thonk.co.uk. That's where you can actually buy the kit to make it. And actually, mentioning the medium thing, there's a really interesting article about the history of Spring Reverbs entitled Everything I Know About Spring Reverbs, which Tom has written, which I also recommend that you read. So check it out. Thank you for listening. I love you greatly. I'll see you soon.